right, well, welcome to everyone who's made it here, whether you're from First Church Unitarian or one of the other wonderful UU congregations that got the invite tonight, or whether you're one of Doug's blog followers or what have you, we're glad you found us. My name is Laura Hoke, and I'm the minister at First Church Unitarian, a church where Doug Sweetser is a member, and Doug will be the featured speaker at this series and tonight. I'm gonna introduce him at the end of my remarks and say a little more about him. But for now, I just wanted to welcome you. I'm glad you found us and give you a sense of what the night will be like, what the evening will be like. So I'm gonna speak fairly briefly at the beginning, just giving a little sense of why I think of this as a theological question and topic and in, a, in the broadest sense. And then Doug is going to give his presentation, which is sort of the heart of the evening. We'll talk for about 35 minutes, and he has some visuals, some slides. And then there will be discussion at the end, a chance for people to um, say anything that they thought of during the talk, or if they have a question that they want to throw out there, or what have you. So that's roughly how it's going to work. My suggestion, and it looks like you're all already doing this, would be that when I'm talking and when Doug is talking that you stay muted, but then for the discussion, we can, we can unmute and, uh, and enjoy each other's thoughts and the company of others too. So I just wanted to start out with a few thoughts. To me, physics and mathematics go hand in hand with theology, that when you ask the big questions when you do that free and responsible search for truth and meaning that Unitarian Universalists talk about, you inevitably talk about science. And when you talk about big questions like where did we come from? How did the universe begin? Those are really questions that are often answered theologically with stories about a creator God. But if you use science, you're answering a lot of the same questions. There's always going to be overlap. But then mathematics always comes into the picture too. You can't really get into talking about cosmology and physics without doing some mathematics. And they kind of weave in and out. So I see all of these fields as very interrelated physics and metaphysics, if you will. Unfortunately, most clergy like me, <laughs> though we might occasionally preach on a related topic we're always going to be lay people and speaking in the broadest terms. But hopefully we can spark some interest and get people who have better scientific minds to speak to the matter, and that will happen tonight. Although interestingly, the scientist who came up with the Big Bang Theory was in fact also a Catholic priest. So occasionally somebody has both skills. I do not. But back to the subject matter at hand. To me, zero is about the most profound thing I can think of. When you really think about zero, what is it? What is zero? If I say I have one bird, you can picture that, or two birds, or one book. But when I say zero, zero books, zero birds, Zero is all zero. I mean, it, doesn't, it almost doesn't make sense and if you think about it literally to talk about zero books because it's just zero. I don't know. I can't wrap my head around zero completely. And going from zero to one isn't like going from one to two in my mind. You know, zero as a jumping off spot is just something entirely different. And it, so it reminds me of why we have this big theological question about how things got created, why we have that universe. You always want to know why there's something rather than nothing. And I attempted to preach on that once. And the answer that was given by Lawrence Krauss, and I don't think Doug is particularly a fan, but the answer that was given by that scientist and others often is that ultimately there's no such thing as nothing. You know, when it comes to the universe, that there's always something, that nothing might be sort of impossible which reminds me of a Kurt Vonnegut quotation. Kurt Vonnegut att attended a Unitarian church. And he said, everything is nothing with a twist. 
And so you have that zero and infinity and just the weirdness of that. We often think people who believe in God will often talk about God as infinite, whatever that means, right? So just I want to end on one last thought. Uh, I was watching a talk by uh, Michio Kaku, and I hope I'm saying his name right. He was talking about how Newton invented calculus. And basically, Newton had this brilliant question, which was, if an apple falls, does the moon fall? Which is a really profound question. And so he invented calculus, essentially, to solve the problem. Yes, the moon is falling, in a sense. And then you have Einstein coming along and saying that gravity isn't about the pool. It isn't about the pool of gravity, that gravity is actually a push, that space is pushing, and that space is curved. So these are such interesting questions. And um, Kaku ended this little talk that I watched by saying that mathematicians pride themselves on thinking about things that are uh, apparently sort of so esoteric as to be useless, and that they were really proud of themselves when they talked about uh, extra dimensional math because it was so beautifully useless. But then string theory came along and string theory exists in extra dimensional math. So you just can't get away from it. Math has something to do, it seems, with the patterns we find in the universe again and again. And Kaku says a candidate for the mind of God for him would be cosmic music the music of strings resonating through 11 dimensional hyperspace, which reminds me of something in our hymnal, which I'll close with, the music of the spheres by Ernesto Cardinal, our har a harmonious universe like a harp. Its rhythms are the equal repeated seasons, the beating of the heart, day, night, the going and returning of migratory birds, the cycles of stars and corn, the mimosa that unfolds by day and folds up again by night, rhythms of moon and tide, one single rhythm in planets, atoms, sea, and apples that ripen and fall and in the mind of Newton, melody, Accord arpeggios, the harp of the universe, unity behind apparent multiplicity, that is the music. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Doug, Doug Sweetser, who is a member of the church I serve, along with his wife, Dara, and their daughter, Ellie, attends as well. Doug uh, graduated from MIT back in 84 with degrees in biology and chemical engineering. And he also has a master's in software engineering from Brandeis. So he is, as we like to say, wicked smart. He works as a software release engineer. But beyond all of that, he's just a really fun and creative person, uh, which I think you'll see tonight. And he also does unfunded research in the numbers as he puts it, the numbers that nature may be using for their magic. So Doug, take it away and thank you. All right, so here's the, the, the starting slide. We're gonna discuss what I consider to be the five most important equations in all of physics. And I should note on that diagonal there, you'll see that the slides were actually designed by my daughter, Ellie. <laughs> She's all of 12 years old, and uh, she has a certain aesthetic. Um, and I actually handed my presentation computer to my daughter to let her do what she wished. And uh, I'm actually kind of proud of the look. So essentially, she had the, all these purple elements. And I think because this is so text heavy a presentation, I think it really adds uh, a nice element to it. So uh, my hat's off uh, to my own daughter. Okay, so you got a little bit about Doug. 
I'm dealing with myself in the third person here. Um, I'm just, you know, almost getting to 60. Uh, Dara proofread these things. And um, I work for Synopsys as this uh, software release engineer. But my real passion is, is the stuff we're kind of talking about uh, here. Um, and I focus on being creative. Now, what, here, this is my definition of creativity, and that is creativity is imagination bounded by logic. Now, I know this all, uh, the Souls Matter group is dealing with imagination uh, this month, um, but I go out of my way to make sure uh, I'm doing uh, creative things such as uh, Lila Miller's uh, Zoom art class. I take that even though I'm a male. <laughs> um, and uh, I like love jamming with the UU Ukes. Uh, and I really am looking forward to uh, getting a vaccine and everybody in the UU Ukes uh, getting their vaccine and, and doing that again. Um, and I'm doing quite a bit uh, in the kitchen if you follow me on Instagram. Um, but I also use logic to deconstruct and destroy some of my own creations, uh, because I find that when I do that, well, if it wasn't worthwhile, then it's gone. Uh, but if it somehow survives but changes, then it's always and ends up being better. Okay, and then finally, um, I call myself. I, I've defined this label for myself: the uh, ultra orthodox uh, fringe physicist. So why did I come up with that as a label? Well, because um, I'm someone uh, without a degree in physics, and I'm trying to make a contribution. Well, the track record there is just really, really bad. And let's be honest, nobody has made a significant contribution from my own position. Um, and the professionals, they know this. <laughs> They've been dealing with this literally for over 100 years, and uh, they block uh, communication, effective communication uh, between the fringe and them because it's usually just um, a waste of their time. Uh, and in fact, my goal is to kill my own ideas. And I actually have experience with that where I had this one idea I got deeply excited by for a decade. And uh, then somebody pointed out a technical problem with it. And I really, it, on Monday, and uh, then it took me five days, but on Friday I was ready to say, no, we gotta, I gotta move on. So I do have experience saying this idea was kind of fun to think about, but you gotta let it go. Nature's the one we're really going against, not other uh, physicists. Okay, so why are we having this discussion series? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fair question. And uh, I think it's the December 6th uh, sermon that Laura Hoke gave on Buddhism. Uh, and this was a quote she read from Thich Nhat Hanh. And we're going to see whether my technology stack is uh, all in place and whether you get to hear this. It should be about a minute long, uh, but well worth a careful listen if it works. To return to the present is to be in contact with life. Life can be found only in the present moment because the past no longer is and the future has not yet come. Buddhahood, liberation, awakening, peace, joy, and happiness can only be found in the present moment. Our appointment with life is in the present moment. The place of our appointment is right here, in this very place. Our appointment with the Buddha, with liberation, and with happiness is here and now. We should not miss this appointment. But that does not mean that physics is Buddhism. Um, it's not, and it never will be. But there are these overlaps. And while she, not only during the Thich Nhat Hanh quote, 
but also uh, many other places in the sermon, I was thinking about this wall hanging that is, I can literally see right now, it's in my basement, um, where I tried to take as much number theory as I could and make a physical representation of it. Um, and so, um, anyway, that's, that's what I did. And uh, she was talking and I was thinking about my number theory and how much overlap there was, because I, I think there really is. Um, so what looks trivial really should not be just glossed over and skipped. You should really stop and try and see what's going, feel what's going on. All right. So let's get back to the question of the evening. And that is, um, what are the most important equations in all of physics? Now, if you were to ask this question to a professional, well, uh, they would give a bunch of different answers. Um, they all have the same kind of structure, those answers. It's some guy's equations. Um, Newton and Einstein, and depending on how much you read in physics, some of those names may sound familiar. Uh, and I gave a talk in June about the one exception to the guy rule, and that would be Emmy Noether's theorem that's about symmetry and conservation laws. Now, I actually think that all this, these st standard answers always tell you some important part of physics, but it doesn't apply to all of physics. I mean, if you're working on gravity, uh, you, you're probably not worried about the standard model. If you're working on how light works, you know, you're not, um, there'll be other parts of physics that you don't care about. Um, and the only thing that seems to show up in all of those expressions are numbers themselves. And uh, at one point, um, Laura talked about the interconnectedness of everything. And to me, that could happen, or that actually does happen with numbers. And so that's why I want to start with thinking carefully about numbers. And I'll kind of underline things when, when I think there's somehow uh, a connection to uh, you know, Laura's lecture, actually. All right, so we're going to start uh, simple. And in fact, Laura brought this number up. We're going to start out with zero. And I actually think that's too small to work with. And that's why we had that uh, tension, she said, where a zero books looks like zero, zero cauliflowers and uh, zero antelopes. Um, so I want to see if we can create a bit of intellectual tension. So how are you going to do that? Well, instead of talking about one zero, I'm going to have four. <laughs> uh, uh, and that first zero is going to be about time. And the other three zeros are about space. Now, this was a development by Einstein. Uh, actually, it was he came up with the idea and his math teacher, Minkowski, uh, said, you know, those guys are really, or sorry, those gender neutral numbers are, are really part of the same kind of structure. And then you're doing things with that structure. This thing is called space time. And I suppose if you are attending this, you probably have heard of space time. And so now I'm doing this zero of space time and I'm giving it a name. The name is here now. The here stands for the three zeros at the end. That's where we usually put the space terms. The now being time actually goes in the first. So I suppose if I was being logically consistent, I would also want you know, the now to be at the end, but we're, we're bright people. I, I hope you, you, you'll accept my uh, little bit of version there. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so this is an important and super simple observation, and that is that we share time. We all showed up here a little bit after seven, and yet we do not share 
the same space. I don't know where all you guys are, but you certainly aren't in the, the basement here in Acton. Um, but my here, I've got a here, and my here is not like your here, right? That's kind of neat. Okay, so this four-part way of drilling with space-time zeros is in standard physics, and it is considered both useful and boring. So let's think a little bit more carefully about here now, using a favorite technique of artists, which is to say, yeah, but what's not there? What's not there is the past. What's not there is the future. What's not there is up. What's not there is down. What's not there is left. What not, what's not there is right. And there's no near and there's no far. So um, your here now is different from my here now because we share the same now, but we don't share the same here. Yeah, and now the math begins. <laughs> Okay, all we're going to do is we're going to add the two together. And I don't think I'm going to shock anyone uh, in the viewing audience uh, by saying that zero plus zero equals zero. So here now plus here now is identical to here now. So the present only leads to the present. And that's something that Thich Nhat Hanh would probably say again in a more eloquent, uh, eloquent kind of way. Okay, so now what I want you to do is try and feel the next moment arriving. I actually think that because it's identical, you can never feel the next moment arriving since it's so deeply similar to this moment right here. And that's my effort at a, at a cone, uh, one of those Zen riddles uh, that, that you're supposed to spend hours and hours in, uh, thinking about. So we're going to do um, some more math. Um, uh, we're going to do a multiplication step. And uh, it's not going to surprise anybody in the viewing audience that uh, 0 times 0 is, in fact, equal to 0. And what kind of puzzled me about this is the times operation. Because back when I was doing math with blocks and blocks only, uh, times meant to repeat. Uh, but if you're going to repeat something zero times, oh, well, that's not really repeating itself at all, is it? Um, but that's the way the math is. <laughs> so I have to accept it. Now, I'm going to make a little math digression, and I'm going to use a word that usually people are taught to be frightened of. Now, we are not going to go into the level where it gets frightening at all, OK? Well, I'm just going to define calculus as the study of change. And that certainly seems like a reasonable thing to, uh, to work on, because change is, is, is usually pretty interesting. And for that to work, what you need is addition you know, and its inverse subtraction. And you need multiplication and it's inverse division. And if you have those two, you can do calculus. And I spent a year uh, in a math graduate program learning that fact. And uh, so I always keep it with me. And so when I saw this little observation about here now, that having both of them, I was really pretty darn excited. I said, I, I will need to go out and look at my technical book on the subject and make sure that it's a mathematical field, which is what is needed to do um, to do calculus. And then I got out this very technical book, 
and it had one little comment that said, "Oh, um, you can't have the the." There's, there needs to be a difference between your expressions for addition and your expressions um, for multiplication. The identity element can't be the same. So, so here now fails. It was just a, like this one clause out of like 11. <laughs> I was like, why did you do that? Um, and it was kind of frustrating. So what did I do? Well, um, I just sat quietly with that failure. Um, and, you know, I did the usual things like walking my dog or doing the dishes or puttering and I thought about, you know, here now is just not a mathematical field because they somehow, for, for, for reasons I don't know, they, they blocked it. And, um, it's not about the study of change. So eventually I said, I've got a new name for here now. I'm going to call it a mathematical canvas. Again, artists should <laughs> know what that word's all about. Uh, so here now, cannot change. And it's this, the study of change, which is calculus, must be painted on that which cannot change, and that would be the mathematical canvas. Uh, and as I was preparing these uh, slides, of course, I found out the official name, um, and that is, it, it's called the zero ring. And uh, I don't know, I far prefer my, uh, my art reference uh, to the jargon, also because it shows the real relationship, I think, to, uh, to the study of change. Um, all right, uh, so now we're gonna move on. We're going to move on to unity. I told you the math would get harder. <laughs> okay, so uh, this again is part of standard physics. Uh, it's a considered very useful, shows up everywhere, uh, but it's also boring. And I say, let's, let's give this more consideration, um, this thing that's in space time. So then I worked on this was this slide and I put as a title, Unity is the Here Future. And if you're into the arts, you'll know you always challenge your assumptions. And I said, why did I put future there? Well, because the future is positive, right? And for a good period of time, I just like, well, duh. <laughs> but I said, you know, you can't just duh, you know, that duh is not a good reason. I, it is on the Simpsons maybe, but, um, but here I've got to find out a nice logical reason for one, positive one, being about the future. Or maybe it could be about the past. That really, that really seemed ridiculous. My, my brain did not like that. <laughs> and, and because I like creating, that meant it was fun to think about it and to challenge my own preconception that the past, that's minus. You have to do minus to deal with that. So uh, this past, look at this phrase here, washing dishes Tuesday. <laughs> washing dishes is a space uh, right up uh, on, this, um, on the ground floor. And Tuesday, of course, is the day. That's a space time uh, phrase that uh, very few people are probably going to uh, like and use ever. Uh, but that's, uh, anyway. Um, and I thought of, uh, and I said, can I think of my past here, my past here as a positive number? Hmm. Well, I was also thinking about this equation, one times one equals one, and saying, yeah, and what does that mean, by the way? I mean, if I'm going to project meaning into it, I mean, other than my, every math teacher you ever meet tells you that and everybody knows it's true, <laughs> which seems rather shallow. Um, but I thought about it and I said, well, what if it's saying that the past here can't change? Maybe that's the message of that. And when I had that idea, the past can't change and therefore one times one both past here remains past here, then 
then maybe that makes some sense that the, there really should be positive one is about the past time. Because then I said, okay, what about the future? Well, the future, I mean, the future's kind of like not here. So it started to, I started to say that makes more sense. Okay, so we only get older as, uh, as I understand it. Uh, and we, we, in other words, we keep on increasing our here past. And I'm 58 right now, and here, I should say, I'm 58 here. And um, this March 4th, I'm going to add another number to that. And uh, so, so it goes. As I, um, and so I really am starting to embrace this notion of here past as positive. And I simply would not have had that as a concept <laughs> unless I did the slide presentation and say, well, there's my title for this slide. But uh, hold on a second. So that was that was my reward uh, uh, for doing this talk right there. Um, now, and now now we're just going to do a wall of math. OK, we just but we're only going to use two numbers. I promise you that we're going to use here now which remember is all the zeros and here past with a positive one. So we're going to add, multiply all these things. Okay. So if you go zero plus zero and zero times zero, oh, that's the canvas idea. That third one there is the, the past remaining the past, no matter what you do. And then we have two more ex uh, equations having to do with um, with zero and one doing different things. Zero plus one equals one, and then zero times one equals zero. So I, I'm calling that for the moment uh, the battle of light and darkness. Uh, one one going against zero and zero uh, going against one. So we'll think about those. Um, and I should say, this T-shirt was built when the title of the talk was the three most important equations in all of physics. <laughs> and then as I was doing this slideshow, I said, you know, let's look at all the relationships uh, between zero and one. And certainly the, those final two are, are fine. And so I was up to like one, one o'clock uh, last night, making sure the t-shirts are, are, were corrected uh, to reflect uh, the, those two equations. Okay. so. The, uh, the here past, here past is the one with the plus one in it, is not one of these mathematical canvases. And that's because one plus one, that equals two. That was the first piece of algebra anybody ever learned. And we're not into two yet. <laughs> that, that will come in time, but uh, actually not in this lecture. That's too advanced. I'm sorry. I've got to put my limitation on these things. Uh, and then we do have the one times one equals one. Okay, so now let's think about these two relationships between zero and unity and how in a certain sense uh, here now wins. In other words, we, as Thich Nhat Hanh made the point, we really are always in here now. Okay, so we have to think of these expressions in that context. All right, so now we've got zero plus one equals one. What that means to me is that here now, I can remember my past. Yeah, I really can. I'm just bringing the two together. I'm here now. And yes, I have a past. I'm not going to go over in my entire past. I think that would take far longer than 40 minutes. But I could, but I have my past with me. And now we have zero times one equals zero. So what's that trying to do? What's that trying to say to us? At least what it's saying to me now is that this operation of times, a very different operation than plus, 
is kind of saying, can I get my past up to here now? And it's like, no, you can't. I got, I got to win. Here now has to win in this battle because you can't take the past, no matter how it looks, and bring it up to here now. So that is my current interpretation. Um, and so that's how I, I look at those equations and read something deeper uh, into them. Okay, so what about this here future being negative? Now, <laughs> I told you I didn't like it. And I'm trying to figure out whether I can like it, whether I can think it's a good thing. Is this the way space-time, this marriage, this awkward marriage between time that's all shared and space that has to be, in, you know, doled out to different different particles out there? Um, okay, so minus one, let's say a day in the future. That's right. That's a minus one. One day in the future and one day in the past. Combine those two together, and you get now, here now. That sounds reasonable to me. That sounds fine. Now we get into this multiplication, which we admit is somehow about things moving in a way. And we're saying one, oh, oh the first number there is zero. So that's a now. Now one. What is that? Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Ah. What is zero one? So that's now, but it's one over to say the right. Okay, and now and one over to the right. Now we multiply those together and I'm not showing you the rules of this math, okay? Because I promise to keep things simple. But the rules of this math mean that that, that becomes this minus one, zero, zero, zero. That's just the way those rules work. You say that's strange. Yes, it is, but it is. And now I say, so what that means to me is that thing that, that was now one step over to the right decided to take one step to the left to be with me in the future time minus one. And that starts to, at least because uh, I'm a math guy, starts to sound more reasonable uh, that, that that's an interpretation of those that expression. Okay, so um, the, the three uh, equations that are on this shirt were the, the zero, the, the canvas idea and this uh, and the, that, that, that the past remains the past. Now there's this thing called um, there's these things called groups in math, and this particular group is called the trivial group. <laughs> and given that I'm saying no, don't 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 treat these things trivially, it's it's a, to me wonderfully uh, on message that the mathematicians have said no, this is the trivial group, and uh, so don't worry about it. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, what they would say, they would, they have a jargony way of talking about this. They say, oh, those are different representations of the same group, Z1. And uh, three ways to do the same thing. And so there's this group identity, Z1, versus individuals being different. And in a certain way, that goes on in a church. We're all members of this church, uh, the UU church, and yet I think we're all kind of different, right? <laughs> so, uh, and so, anyway, um, I thought that was kind of a fun observation. Now, I told you that when I broke a rule, that it's my responsibility to tell you I broke it. So I did, okay? Two of those equations uh, are illegal. And th those are the ones with the multiplication in them. And that is because in standard physics, 
Uh, four numbers like that are called these things called vectors. And vectors can be added and subtracted, but they can't be just multiplied together. So um, vectors can be any number of dimensions. And, you know, Laura talked about, you know, is it 10 or 11 or, or whatever? That, that's a great deal of flexibility. And it's hard to imagine, uh, even though we're in an imaginative uh, month, as it were, uh, physicists letting go of that, um, that capacity to work in, in an arbitrary number of dimensions. But here's, here's a vector I made up, and it's uh, my age here, shoe size. And hopefully this strikes you as silly, <laughs> but it's legal. Okay, I didn't do anything wrong. I can add two such things together and um, it would be more silly, um, but there's nothing wrong with it officially. And all equations in, in technical books are written as vectors and um, or a generalization of them called tensors, but that doesn't matter. Um, and the types of numbers that I deal with, that I specialize in, uh, they're collections of four numbers, like you've seen in, in like almost every single slide except for my shoe size one. Um, and they can be treated actually as just one number in the sense that you can add them, you can subtract them, you can multiply them, and you can divide them. And you, you, should be able to maybe get the plus and the minus ones, you know, that actually I, uh, yeah, you can do that. I'm sure you can. Don't, you can't get the, the multiplication or the division. So don't worry about the detail. Just know that it's legal and uh, that it's perfectly fine in detail. Uh, but why, why do that? Because it looks kind of scary. Uh, well, the reason is um, that I think numbers have to be intimate with each other. And in the sense that they have to be able to get close and to mix in every possible way, because we live in such a ridiculously amazing uh, universe. You, I, you cannot do that with the, with the shoe size hanging off there, um, just because you thought you could add it, no. That's, that's an illegal move in my, my opinion. You really have to stay constrained, in my opinion, to, uh, to four numbers because you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide them. And um, so you can be open to all these diverse relationships between the numbers. Uh, there are things that surprise uh, when you do this. Uh, just, just this week, I came across uh, negative numbers uh, for the future. Um, but where I will consistently break the rules of mathematical physics as they are today is when I have a collection of four numbers and I say, let's multiply them and see what happens. Okay, so, so yes, we have made it uh, to the discussion time. Um, I, I really hope to deeply listen to you because it all has helped me already. <laughs> uh, Laura said, hey, why don't we make this a discussion group so you can hear with other people how they view these things. It's like, yeah, that's a good idea. And anyway, um, that that's happened. Uh, oh yeah, and somebody said, you know, we shouldn't have this on uh, on a Thursday because that's when people sing. And uh, so yeah, we moved it to Friday and all these things. Um, all right. I, what I'm going to do as an ultra orthodox fringe physicist, I can tell you what physics knows, and I can tell you what they don't know. And I'm not going to promote anybody's uh, work trying to figure out the problems. I will just try and describe the problems more precisely, perhaps. Uh, and if I need to keep the talks on target, I will. Um, but I also want to bring up this idea I call um, always join words with space time. Um, because this is not the way anybody speaks. Um, Nobody talks about the uh, the um, dish dishwashing Tuesday sort of thing, um, <clears throat> but that's what you need to do if you really always consistently think about space time, not time or space alone. Um, 
And the same thing goes for energy momentum. In fact, it's even probably worse there where I don't know of even professionals who show this l level of discipline. They talk about energy all the time. They don't talk about energy momentum. But I think you need to balance the two because they're, remember they're balancing in a certain sense the time aspects of things, which we can all share, and the space things, which you know we all have to be slightly different places. All right. So let me get, just give you one example of this, and that would be time travel. Um, you know, it's to me, I should say, it's not a thing. Space time travel is a thing. Uh, and we're all doing space time travel right now. Uh, it's kind of boring because the space time travel is really in mostly in time and most of us are not moving around too much. Uh, but we are moving forward in time and we're not feeling that <laughs> because zero plus zero equals zero. All right. So uh, one last slide here. Uh, and as it says on the back of the T-shirt, uh, get zero and one done right and all else will follow. Um, I should say there's there are the resources they're all formed the same kind of root as it were bit.ly and then capital s capital p capital r underline site will get you to the website that i'm creating for this uh, series of five talks uh the first slides are also available and i actually use the zoom zoom thing to actually get here uh so i can i can actually remember it from heart because it's, it's not that hard to, it's not a big that big a variation